Um, as we do some initial welcome and do some little bit of context setting, I'd like to invite all of you to please put your name and your organization into the chat box. This will let us know who's on the line so we can do a little bit of connecting even though we're in this sort of vast virtual world. <clears throat> so for those who aren't familiar with the California Improvement Network, we're a community of healthcare professionals who are committed to identifying and spreading better ideas for care delivery to improve patient and provider experience and the health of populations while lowering the cost of care. We do that by building meaningful cross-sector relationships. We also do that by committing to action as individuals, as organizations, and collectively together, and through learning new skills, approaches, and concepts. So taken together, these three levers uh, really increase the ability of organizations um, across the healthcare ecosystem to engage in improvement efforts. It sounds like a closed network. I don't mean it to be, it's open. I hope you will all be part of it in just a moment. If you haven't had a chance to sign up for our newsletter, we'll give you um, the information to do that. CIN, which is the acronym for California Improvement Network, um, has been working to improve care and ultimately the health and ultimately the health of all Californians since 2005. It's a project of the California Healthcare Foundation um, and is managed by Health Force Center at UCSF. CHCF aims to advance meaningful, measurable improvements in the way the healthcare delivery system provides care to Californians, particularly those with low incomes and those whose needs are not well met by the status quo. Health Force Center at UCSF is an organization dedicated to driving change in healthcare. Our mission is to equip people with workforce knowledge, leadership skills, and network connections to create a collective force for health equity in action. As I mentioned just a moment ago, if you're not already connected to CIN, I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. We only send it once a month. We try not to, to spam. It is chock full of stories, ideas, and tools to improve care delivery and advance health equity. Um, and also our website. So please check it out. And I will ask my colleague, Marie Hubbard, to put in both the sign up to the newsletter as well as the website into the chat box. You can check us out. So CIN, it's a really responsive and agile network. It's designed that way. It's fueled by the energy and ideas of all of its members. So that means that every single event, resource, workshop, publication, it comes from the priorities and needs of its members from the community. And the toolkit that we're here to talk about today, the toolkit to advance racial health equity and primary care improvement um, is a direct result of the CIN community coming together and saying, we are here to ensure high quality care and healthy communities. And if we are going to do that, that means having equitable health outcomes and experiences. And we need more tools and resources to do this essential work. That was the genesis of this project. And we're really excited to be at this point in time to share it with you all today. From that call to action, if you will, CIN formed a racial health equity work group. This, uh, this group came together in early 2021 and they met for more than a year. Um, you can look at all these wonderful organizations and all the fantastic people who work within these organizations and just look at all the variety, all the different types of organizations from across the state and all the different people, people at all different levels, all different types of roles. And this group came together to say, okay, let's try to figure something out. We know we need more resources and support to advance racial health equity. What is a tangible resource that doesn't exist that we could collectively create to fill a need and help us advance racial health equity work today? Um, that's how this, that's how the, that's what the group focused on. And that's how we got to the toolkit. After a few months of exploratory work together, we partnered with Health Begins to really bring this toolkit to life. Health Begins is a mission-driven consulting and training firm that's committed to driving radical transformation in health equity. 
And they partnered with CIN and the work group to take the ideas and the needs and turn them into something that is incredibly concrete and useful. And that is the toolkit. And we're so excited to share it with you today. So today you'll see our sort of official learning objectives for the webinar. We hope by the end of the webinar that you'll be able to identify a roadmap for improvement, which includes seven concrete opportunities for advancing racial health equity in primary care. We also hope you'll learn and be inspired from other work group members who are already using the toolkit and identify at least one way to use the toolkit to advance racial health equity focus primary care improvement efforts. But really what we most wanna do is excite and inspire you to take some concrete actions to advance racial health equity. And throughout this conversation that we'll be having today, um, inform what else you may need to do this work effectively. Like we recognize this is part of a lifelong journey and part of many tools and resources for doing this work together. And the California Improvement Network Health Force Center, UCSF, CHCF, Health Begins, we're all here to support that work and want to create more resources and supports and technical assistance to help with that. So before I hand it off to the team over at Health Begins, just wanted to preview very quickly the seven opportunities that are in the toolkit and that will be talked about in much more depth in the coming 45 minutes. We want to do a quick poll to get a sense of which of these areas for improving racial health equity in primary care are a priority for you and your organization? Opportunity one is about organizing teams that are dedicated to incorporating racial health equity and care improvement workflows. Opportunity two is about collecting data on race, ethnicity, and language, real data. Three is about how do you identify measures to stratify with that data? Four is analyze and identifying root causes of the identified inequities from that stratification. Five is about identifying and co-designing the improvement efforts themselves. Six, guiding and monitoring the improvement efforts after they've been implemented. And seven is then informing and accelerating institutional transformation and community action. These are not meant to be linear or stepwise. You can jump, you can dive into this work at any point in time, circle back, tackle all of it or parts. But as you look at this roadmap, seven opportunities to advance racial health equity in primary care, we'd love to get a quick sense so that we can tailor our conversation today about which of these are priorities. So we've got a poll up. If you could just take a minute and fill out that poll, that would be great. It's always fun to watch the polls dance when you're one of the hosts. I'm seeing entries across the board. <clears throat> We've got about 55% of you have completed. We'll keep it open for just a few more seconds. We know there's a lot to read through. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. So get your last click in. All right, and I think this will work. Can you all see the poll results if I put them here on this screen? All right, great. Okay, so as you can see, we've got a lot around opportunity to collecting real data and then also the stratifying, figuring out which inequities to address and the identification and co-design piece. So a lot around the, the, those middle efforts, um, which I think is to be expected and it's exciting and we look forward to digging into this with all of you. All right, so I'm going to, so we're gonna pull that down and I'm gonna hand this off to my colleagues at Health Begins. So just bear with us as we do the um, switching of who's sharing their screen. I will stop share. It's lovely to see everybody and I'll hand it off to Health Begins.
And I can see your screen, but I can't hear anything yet. So you may need to come off mute. There we go. Wonderful. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I think I was unable to unmute myself and my apologies. Um, hi, everybody, and uh, thanks so much to Rebecca and to Marie um, at CIN. Uh, my name is Rishi Manchanda. I'm joined today by my colleagues Rosa Doe and Nasra Miles, and we are from Health Begins. Um, before I tell you just a, a quick second more about who we are and then turn the baton to my colleagues, I, I just want to express our deep, deep gratitude. Uh, first and foremost, of course, to Rebecca, Marie, Melissa, everybody at the CIN team and to um, the, the uh, also to the members of the uh, CIN Racial Equity Work Group, a remarkable leaders across the state who really dedicated uh, their time, uh, were present, contributed deeply to um, the questions and considerations we were posing to them to think about what uh, we could do to make sure that this toolkit was not just a, another document that would sit someplace online or on a virtual shelf, but really be uh, practically useful to leaders uh, in primary care, those who deliver primary care, pay for it, or support it. Uh, it's because of the Racial Equity Work Group and the support of the CI in itself that this toolkit is a toolkit that we are genuinely excited about today. And I really do want to uh, to say that we will not be able to cover all of the greatness uh, that is contained within this document, uh, nor be able to do justice to the, the greatness of the people who are involved in this. But we do want to uh, take the opportunity today to orient you, orient you to what you will see in this document and why um, uh, we believe that once you do have a chance to not just read it, but to review it with your colleagues in your workplaces, in your practice settings, in your organizations, um, and consider how to advance the mission of primary care, you'll see that this document um, is uh, something that can be truly helpful, at least as a touchstone, if not a catalyst uh, for really important work to advance racial equity. So as you can tell, I'm deeply passionate about this work, and it's because of the incredible people we had a chance to work with. Um, with that, uh, Health Begins is an organization that has had the privilege of not just working with CIN, but uh, uh, working with a variety of colleagues across the nation, people that we describe as courageous leaders, the courageous leaders who exist within institutions uh, committed to advancing equity and then work with Health Begins and our partners to think about how to advance equity by addressing, in particular, the social and the structural drivers of health equity, social needs, social determinants, and structural determinants of health equity. Um, as a primary care physician myself uh, and one who's had the privilege of caring for um, for families uh, um, and individuals who belong to historically marginalized communities across the state and across the country, I will tell you that uh, the work that we do at Everyday Health Begins afford us, affords us the opportunity to work with incredible leaders, including many of you who are on the line today. Um, and so in that respect, I'm gonna, uh, in that context, I'm going to go ahead and turn the baton over to my colleague Rosa Doe to uh, bring us now into the context of why this toolkit is something that we are excited about um, with our partners at CIM. Rosa? Thanks so much, Rishi. Hi, everyone. My name is Rosa Doe. I'm the Health Equity Senior Associate Health Begins, and I also share Rishi's sentiments um, in regards to the deep gratitude um, for this work and um, the collaboration um, to make this toolkit a reality. So to start, um, I just wanted to ground us in the core beliefs that um, are shared by the CIN Racial Health Equity Work Group in developing this toolkit. So this toolkit's vision of a more just, equitable, and well-resourced and effective primary care rests on these two foundational beliefs. First, primary care cannot improve the health of patient populations without simultaneously advancing health equity. Um, and what we mean by health equity um, is that everyone has the opportunities and resources they need to be as healthy as possible and no one is disadvantaged due to social circumstances or policies. And the second core belief is that health equity, including racial health equity, is core to high quality primary care and that high quality care is equitable care. So we call up both health equity and racial health equity because structural racism has systematically denied opportunities and resources based on race. So therefore, health equity is inextricably linked to, to, to racial equity. And so we define key terms further in the um, background of the toolkit. And the second point here is drawn from and aligned directly with NCQA's three core ideas that drive their work um, on health equity. 
So I'm going to pass it over to my colleague Nasra to share additional context for the toolkit. Thank you so much, Rosa. And so for our next part, we're going to go over the key question that we asked ourselves. So during the creation of this toolkit, we asked ourselves the key question that came from Dr. Ibram X. Kendi, the author of How to Be an Anti-Racist, and it goes as follows. Those who work for organizations that deliver, pay for, or support primary care uh, face, and fundamental, face a fundamental decision, and it is, will you collectively allow racial inequities to persist? as a racist institution, or will you confront racial inequities as an anti-racist organization? With that, we wanted to make sure that this toolkit was created and presented through an equitable and anti-racist lens. During this presentation, you all will be able to see and identify how we implemented this, implemented the key question throughout the toolkit. And I will call on my colleague Rishi to see if he has anything else to add to this sentiment. Uh, nothing to add, Nasra and Rosa as well. And also, I just note um, in the chat um, that there may be some crowd noise here. I apologize. Uh, this, the the conference uh, that I'm attending right now um, apparently is as excited about equity as we are, um, and so I will do my best to make sure that we talk through um, uh, these things without being too disruptive. And apologies again for the sound. Uh, but uh, Nasra, if you want to extend the um, the slide forward to the next one, I'll just say that th the reason that Dr. Kendi's question was such a helpful um, a question for us in the way that Nasser described and the way that we adapted it uh, to bring into the context of primary care. The reason it was so powerful was because of the recognition that uh, the, all of the collaborators, all of the advisors in this process were clear about from day one, and that is the importance um, it, when it comes to moving forward racial equity in primary care to make sure that we're grounded grounded in, in a shared understanding of what racism is, what racial injustice um, looks like in America, and of course, um, grounded in a shared understanding of what its implications are for primary care. Um, if you can just click forward one slide, uh, one animation there, you'll see in this toolkit that there are several different um, uh, core uh, grounding principles and uh, bits of wisdom and knowledge that have been chronicled by scholars, including scholars of color for many years, especially in recent years uh, since the murder of George Floyd. Uh, and so we do our, uh, our, our best in this document to be able to highlight and elevate some of these core foundational beliefs that are really critically important to getting grounded in the shared understanding of racism and its implications for primary care. So you can see uh, grounding principle number one, and if you go to the next, You'll see principle number two, where uh, there is a clear understanding of how uh, the history of segregation and stratification in society in the U.S., based on a long-standing history of racism, um, also implicates and impacts health care um, in particular. Uh, and as you go to the next one as well, there's also um, uh, ways in which we then recognize, uh, as authors have done here for some time, the ways in which uh, the harms of structural and institutionalized racism have been and continue to be primarily directed at black, Latinx, indigenous, Asian, and other people of color. And as you can see, as you go down as well, a recognition that um, that these exploitative uh, labor practices and other policies of social disinvestment that have long been the mechanisms by which structural racism and structural violence has been um, implemented in the US, uh, these mechanisms um, are uh, clearly impacting um, people of color in the U.S. and directed at them, but they also wreak havoc um, in ways that impact all Americans, regardless of racial background as well. And as such, as you can see here, racism and white supremacy are, quote, a self-defeating form of exclusion, a determination not to share resources, even if the ultimate result is that everyone suffers. Uh, these That's a quote from um, Heather McGee in um, uh, her recent book, The Some of Us. We try to do here in the getting grounded element of the, the toolkit before getting into some of the practical improvement oriented um, opportunities to be able to advance racial equity was to ensure that in reading this document and in considering and reviewing this document in your practice, in your organization, uh, that we're all doing our part to pause and really consider the deep shared understanding, the deep history that must be understood uh, continuously by all of us and discuss so that we can truly understand why racial equity is so vitally important to uh, the mission of primary care. So let's go to the next slide here. I'll turn it over to Rosa and we can go through a little bit now about what it means having uh, getting, getting grounded now into what the toolkit goes through in terms of these opportunities. Rosa? Great. Thanks so much, Rishi. So to provide a high-level overview, 
um, in orientation to the content of the toolkit, you'll see here the table of contents with key sections that can be clustered into generally four broad areas. So next slide. Um, the first five sections that we just went over around the grounding, um, it provides the background and guidance to get started. This also includes a quick start guide and roadmap that Rishi will share in more detail later. Next slide. And then we have next the um, seven opportunities that Rebecca shared early on um, with the poll. Um, so these are practice level opportunities to advance racial health equity and care improvement efforts. Um, and as emphasized earlier, these aren't meant to be linear, but offer entry points based on your team or organization's current priorities and level of readiness. Um, next slide. The opportunities are then followed by three case studies featuring real world exemplars showing how integrating racial health equity in primary care looks like in action across, um, we feature three different states and uh, different primary care settings. And next slide. And then the last few sections of the toolkit include additional resources for getting grounded, uh, getting grounded and building that uh, shared foundational understanding uh, to normalize an organizational commitment to advancing racial equity. Um, we also have endnotes with links to sources um, cited throughout the toolkit for further information and acknowledgements to all the wonderful and committed leaders, champions, and collaborators who contributed to this toolkit. So next slide, who should use this toolkit? Um, and I won't go into detail each of these um, kind of four stakeholders, but we've identified four types of stakeholders who can um, use the toolkit to identify opportunities to incorporate and advance racial equity in primary care. So for primary clinicians or care team members, second, directors and managers of primary care departments, practices, or teams, third, C-suite or senior leaders representing provider organizations or pairs such as health plans, and then fourth, leaders and managers of other organizations that support um, primary care providers, such as consortia and primary care associations. So each of these key stakeholders have a role um, to play to initiate, convene, guide, or support staff to identify opportunities and or dedicate time and resources um, to advance racial health equity and care improvement projects. Um, an important note that we also included in the toolkit, if you identify with any of these stakeholder groups is that you don't need to wait for organizational wide transformation and a complete cultural shift toward anti-racist norms and practices before getting started on this work. Um, there are opportunities to demonstrate improvement and value in parallel and as part of organizational wide efforts to operationalize commitments to racial health equity. Um, so which brings us to the next slide. And apologies for my dog, the joys of working from home. Um, we wanted to share the key drivers and opportunities to advance racial health equity and primary care improvement efforts, and we've identified an aim for the field. So focusing on organizations, as I mentioned previously, that provide, pay for, or support primary care to more than double the number of improvement initiatives or projects that advance racial equity by the end of next year. So we're saying target, end of 2023. Um, double the number of improvement initiatives that advance racial health equity. Then um, we identified nine key drivers or essential capabilities as critical to advancing this aim. And this toolkit focuses on seven of these key drivers as highlighted on the slide, treating each as a discrete opportunity for continuous improvement. So these seven opportunities specifically go beyond building awareness and understanding of racial health equity to action, which was the scope and focus of this toolkit. So we acknowledge that you know, organizations and teams need to build that foundational understanding. We provide that grounding, we provide resources if that's where you need to get started. But really the focus of this toolkit is to take that into action. How do you implement this work and integrate racial health equity into primary care? So to dive further into the key drivers and opportunities, I'm gonna turn it back to Rishi to walk through how to use this toolkit and get started. Thanks, Rosa. Sophia, the next slide, please. Thank you. 
Um, we provided in the toolkit, and I see some of the comments in the chat about uh, wh whether the toolkit will be provided afterwards, and, and as you'll see in the answers, the good news is the toolkit's already available for download, and so you'll see the links in the chat now. And as you'll see in the toolkit, there's a quick start guide. It's a lengthy document, right, that has very specific tips and recommendations that we'll uh, highlight in a second. But one of the important things that we uh, provided in the toolkit is a quick start guide, uh, starting with first our suggestions to review each of the key drivers that Rosa just described, particularly the ones that are highlighted here. Um, and to do so, not just individually, but with your colleagues. Um, as you see in the driver diagram, the, uh, one of the ways to review and really assess uh, how well developed these key drivers are within your organization, uh, whether you're again providing primary care, paying for primary care, or otherwise supporting primary care practitioners. Um, one of the ways to do that is to, to assess that is to use a scale of one to five, um, where one is poorly developed, uh, in your opinion, or five is well developed. That self-assessment, especially if it's done in a, uh, with colleagues uh, uh, in your organization, can help to identify which key drivers then to prioritize. Step three here prioritizing key drivers that are not well developed or effectively implemented in your organization. So for example, if you see, as you scan to the right in the, di in the driver diagram, you might find that um, through dialogue with your colleagues that the ability to prioritize and stratify measures by race, ethnicity, and language data, real data, uh, is an area that's not well developed, a, a capability that you as an organization have not yet fully implemented. You might score that as a two or a three out of five. Um, having done that, you can go on the next slide uh, then review the corresponding opportunities for improvement. So based on the, the, the self-assessment of where your organization is at uh, when it comes to these key drivers uh, required to be able to truly advance racial equity uh, through primary care improvement efforts, you can then identify the opportunities for improvement as an organization. And you'll see uh, each of those key drivers that were highlighted on the last slide are now um, uh, cor have corresponding opportunities for improvement. The recommendation is to, from an improvement perspective, a continuous learning and improvement perspective, is to then uh, commit to pursuing at least one of those opportunities over the uh, subsequent four to six months. And to make sure that that's a formal part of your organization's quality and performance improvement strategy. Not a side project, not an initiative of one person in the organization who is um, the equity expert or the lead, but, but truly uh, an implemented um, part of your organization-wide quality improvement and performance improvement strategy. Um, and we uh, provide in each of these opportunities, as you'll see in a second, uh, some tips, identify some challenges, uh, and more importantly, identify the resources that you can also use to be able to now support you as you pursue that opportunity. And after that, that period of time, whether it be four months, six months, and the ways that you define, we recommend step six here, which is to re revisit and then repeat those steps, um, the previous steps I just outlined, so that you're reviewing these opportunities. So as we see in the next slide here, um, we wanted to just now bring this to life a little bit and understand how these um, key, th this quick start guide now comes into focus uh, by orienting a little bit on the next slide about how to navigate and use this. So once you've gone through the process and identified which key drivers are most relevant, which opportunities for improvement to pursue on the next slide, you'll see a little bit now about how this might actually feel in practice. So for a moment, just imagine now that you've come together with your colleagues, for example, a, a lead primary care practitioner in your clinic, a clinician, um, a quality improvement director, um, a case manager, an administrator in your clinic, for example, and you've come together and you've identified that there is an important opportunity for improvement based on your self-assessment as a group. And as you go to the next slide, Nasra, let's say, for example, that you come together and identify that one particular opportunity for improvement uh, based on your self-assessment, is the opportunity to improve the collection of data related to race, ethnicity, and language. What you'll see here in this uh, document, then, is an opportunity there in front of you to look at the uh, th this particular set of resources that we've put together, the recommendations uh, to start with. So if you see on the bottom left, the red arrow here, starts to identify some key recommendations uh, to start moving forward to improve your data collection strategies. Uh, a, B, C, D, and E, for example, um, provide uh, high-level recommendations along with some corresponding information that uh, can help you spur that conversation around how to now um, identify specific improvement projects to work on to improve data collection. You'll also see on the right-hand side of the screen, the other red arrow points to the challenge. And this is one of the common challenges. Uh, this is a section in this opportunity, at least as with others, where you'll start to see some of the challenges that were identified by the stakeholders that 
Um, we interviewed the stakeholders who were involved in this process, including the CI and workgroup members. Um, and this is an important, particularly important area because it's one thing to just review the recommendations. It's a whole other thing to realize that there are common challenges, especially that peers in primary care have identified. If you go to the next slide, it's important not only to understand the challenge, but then to start to review some of the tips about how to address that challenge. And you can, so you can see here as you scan down and to the right across the screen here that for every challenge, major challenge we've identified for this particular opportunity for improvement, there's a corresponding set of tips. Again, tips that were informed by review of the literature, um, conversations with Vanguard organizations and exemplars across the country, our own experience at Health Begins and our work with partners across the country, and as importantly, the experience of the CIN workgroup members who also brought their direct experience leading and providing primary care. So if you go to the next uh, screen here, the next slide, uh, each opportunity section is not just a set of recommendations, a set of um, challenges, a set of tips to address those challenges, but also comes with links to very specific resources that, again, were based on this review of the, of the landscape. So you'll see links with some brief descriptors of each of the corresponding resources that can help you to be able to implement the recommendations and implement the tips uh, to address those common challenges. So this is a way to now to start to see, as you would review uh, here at this, the, the group of four people that I described in that scenario, how you as a primary care practitioner with a case manager, an administrator, for example, and a quality improvement director can come together to start to uh, not just discuss at a broad level an opportunity to improve data collection, but start to find the, the, the most appropriate and best curated resources to be able to now uh, translate that commitment, that idea into action, especially over the next four to six months. So we can go to the next slide. And I think with that, um, I'll turn it over back to, I believe, to Rebecca. Yeah, hi, great. And we'll, we'll go ahead and pull the slides down. We have about 10 minutes for questions before we hear from um, some of our work group members and start to think about how else we might be able to support you all in implementing aspects of this toolkit. So feel free to chat in. Feel I don't think we can unmute, but I do think we can raise hands. <laughs> Nope, I'm getting a no. So feel free to chat in if you have a question that hasn't been addressed. Um, if you've had a chance to look at the toolkit or click on the link, you'll see that it is lengthy. So, you know, part of our goal today is to help you all understand once you've had a chance to digest, once you've had a chance to, to connect with some of your colleagues and do that self-assessment, what it might look like to work through some of this and how the toolkit can help you. So as Rishi shared, it can help with understanding, you know, what are the key issues? What are those essential steps that I need to take? You can think about it almost like a checklist. Um, what are some challenges I may run into and how can I uh, then work through some of those challenges? And then of course, it's, it's one toolkit. It can't solve everything, right? So there's a plethora of resources in there that should be um, ideal and supportive for helping you do the work. Great, so as questions may come up, you can feel free to chat them in. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen once again. Just give me one moment. You know, and as we've, um, <clears throat> excuse me, as, as we've mentioned a couple of times, you know, this toolkit really is uh, the labor of love of this work group, who all of their ideas, their needs, their passions, um, and we want to just express our gratitude and also hear from them. So this group has had the chance to have seen this toolkit ahead of time as they directly informed its creation. Um, and I think what they can provide is some insight into how might you use this toolkit? What is your first step? What are you excited about? So I'm really pleased today to have Leticia Barid and Lauren, Lauren Abrams and Christine Ortwine from HealthNet and Health Center Partners of Southern California, respectively. Um, and we're going to ask each of them to share a little bit about which of those seven opportunities in the roadmap for improvement that they're most excited about advancing in their organization and with their colleagues and what their next step is for using the toolkit. And for that second one, um, I'd like you all to, to think about as they're sharing, you know, start to think about what might your next step be? Is it to share it with a colleague? Is it to really dive in and do that self-assessment? Have you already identified which piece you want to work on? And so then what's your next step related to that opportunity area? 
So with that, I will pull it down and I will invite Leticia to share a little bit about um, how HealthNet is using the toolkit so far or their plans to do so. Great, thank you, Rebecca. Quick audio check. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound perfect. Okay, great, we did it. Okay, good. Um, hi everyone, Leticia Barrett. Um, I uh, am honored to be here today and to present on behalf of uh, Dr. Pooja Mittal, who is currently presenting at another conference. Um, and for um, anyone who doesn't know Dr. Mittal, she is our um, Health Equity Officer for HealthNet of California. Um, so my name is Leticia. I am Director over Program Accreditation Team with HealthNet of California. My team scope includes the NCQA program accreditation team, the CAP survey member experience team, and the quality health equity team. Um, we are within the quality structure of the organization, so there's a lot of alignment between our teams. Uh, within my structure specifically, we support the member journey, health equity, quality improvement projects, and we ensure our processes and initiatives align with NCQA and state requirements. Um, so, uh, the question, next step, and how do we anticipate using it? Um, so at HealthNet, um, health equity has been in our core values for quite some time. Um, we have a dedicated cultural and linguistics team who's been focused on improving equity and experience for our members over, um, you know, for over 10 years. Um, and our cultural linguistics team, which is now known as uh, the health equity team throughout the organization, has over 70 years of cumulative experience. Um, they're some of the most passionate individuals I've ever worked with. Um, so while there is that historical focus there, um, there's always opportunities for continued growth. Um, and I think one thing that stood out to me while I was reading the toolkit is how it can be used to add structure to something that in essence, many employees and individuals are already committed to at their core, right? So the idea that you can organize values in a way that really drive the improvements you're committed to seeing. Um, so, um, you know, for our organization, I'm pleased to say we've already started to implement quite a, quite a bit of this work in a structured approach. Um, it takes a village, but I, I agree with what's been said previously that the first step is really socializing the importance of the work, um, including the necessary partners, which includes, you know, internal operations, our community partners, providers, analytics, and our members, and then pulling together the forum and the space to continue that dialogue and to weave health equity throughout each area, initiative, and operational process. Um, so the, you know, the, the one, the opportunities that really stood out to Dr. Mattel and I when we were going through it um, the first one I'd like to touch upon is Opportunity 7, which is the Inform and Accelerate Institutional Transformation and Community Action. Um, so as an organization, we're really focusing our efforts at the geographic level um, through our health equity improvement zone. And so these zones are areas within specific counties where residents experience a disproportionate share of identified inequities for certain health conditions. Um, and in order to address the inequities, it does warrant a commitment at a local level, addressing those local barriers and partnering with the community to accelerate the improvement. Um, so we do drive this work at a community level, a member level, and a provider level. And the investments are aligned in these communities. And I'll also comment that the structure of our quality health equity team really aligns with this vision. We have a senior health equity specialist strategically placed in these um, specific counties. Um, the other area I'd like to focus on is on um, opportunity three, um, which is the identified measures stratified by race and ethnicities. So we do have a robust tool, the disparity dashboard that we utilize. Um, but you know, in the um, in our commitment to the continuous improvement, we are we are expanding this tool. Uh, we will be adding additional layers. We are continuing to collect race and ethnicity. Um, we are working, working with our IT team to ensure we have the systems in place to support this additional data. Um, and in addition, in uh, fall of this year, we are um, piloting a program with NCQA to test their um, HEDIS measures that will be stratified, stratified by race and ethnicity. So that will be happening in fall, and we're excited to participate in that and really inform NCQA on the standards. Um, and our barriers and our best practices. So that's an exciting opportunity. 
Did mm -hmm. I get all the questions, Rebecca? You sure okay, did. Good. Thank you so okay, much. <laughs> all right, great. I were, we're going to shift over to Lauren and Christine now, and I will unpin you. And, we're, and I want to just quickly acknowledge we're getting some messages that some people can't see everybody and some people can't. So we're doing our best um, to try to resolve that. Um, and in the meantime, we'd like to hear from Lauren and Christine. Hi. Hey. Thanks for having us. Um, I'm sharing my minutes with my colleague Christine today, so I'm going to keep this <clears throat> very brief. Um, my name is Lauren Abrams. We wanted to share with you that Health Quality Partners um, plans to apply this toolkit to a specific project that's focused on um, screening data, some cancer screening data. Our organization really needed a toolkit, or we needed a tool, I guess, to help guide us in making our programs more equitable and anti-racist. So we're excited for the opportunity to really um, use and practice with this new toolkit, toolkit to test an equity-centered quality improvement effort. Um, and we plan on starting with opportunity number two in the data collection. It looked like a lot of people are thinking about that. Um, that's where we anticipate starting out uh, Preliminary data was pulled for this project and large gaps in the information required for deep further work were found. Um, so we plan to look at the variation in data collection across the domains as recommended in the toolkit and primary care sites. Um, and it would just be very difficult to move forward with the other opportunities in the, on the roadmap without, without starting there at opportunity two. So that's, um, just very quickly how we are, we're just so excited to get our feet wet and wanted to thank everyone who worked on this toolkit because we're just so looking forward to using it. Christine? Thanks, Lauren. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having us. My name is Christine Ortwine. I am the manager for population health analytics at our sister organization, Integrated Health Partners. Um, it's subsidiary and work hand in hand with health quality partners, right? We're all under the Health Center Partners family of companies. Um, and so I work directly with Lauren and, and team on various projects at IHP. We are, because we're a clinically integrated network, one of the um, initiatives that we worked on is a shared population health management tool. And so we have access to that tool. And for those uh, health centers that are participating alongside within health quality partners, we have the opportunity to leverage that tool in, in its capacity. And so as Lauren said, we have identified a previous project, cancer screening data, cervical cancer screening data, actually. Um, and we're able to use that integrated tool, which has nine direct EHR feeds from each of our participating health centers. And so we have access to the EHR data that includes the, the real data, right? Our, our various demographics that live within the EHR. Um, and what we want to do is focus on, on two and three, right? We have a measure um, and we want to begin the stratification using the data we have access to. And as Lauren said, uh, our first pass, we realized that there was quite a bit of noise. We had some uh, holes in the data. And so we want to use the tool to work with the health centers on ways for improving the data capture um, and also looking at the various strata. So one of the things that we can do with our uh, vendor is leverage not only the shared platform, but they also have some proprietary uh, risk algorithms, right, that are in there that help us stratify um, across various levels of risk, as well as integrated census data. So we're able to look at the demographic data coming from the census um, and then look across strata, particularly um, maybe geographic strata when we look at zip codes, so we can do some geospatial stratifications, risk stratifications, and then the census stratification. And so looking across that various strata to try and determine if there are glaring, um, you know, differences in outcomes across these screening measures, and then working with our health centers to improve the data. The toolkit is amazing, and I know all of us are excited to be able to use it um, to provide value to our health centers and, and potentially close some of these disparities that we're seeing in the data. So thank you to everyone. Um, can't wait to get started. Thank you, Christine, and thank you, Lauren. 
That's just wonderful to hear how it's uh, already helping and supporting your work. And we look forward to hearing more from all of you um, about uh, you know, what works, what ends up working well, what doesn't, and where additional supports or help could be needed. We are getting some questions in through the Q&A function and also in the chat. Um, we have time to answer a few. Um, so Rishi and team, are there, I can tell there's some, some typing going on. Are there a couple that we'd like to, to, to speak to or perhaps ask others on the line to respond to? Yeah, I'm happy to, um, to chime in. There was a, a question from an anonymous attendee who had asked about the foundational work, how to really get the buy-in mm -hmm. and the um, uh, kind of shared level of understanding around the importance of this work uh, socialized within uh, among staff. So I just answered this in the Q&A and the answer section, uh, I'll just voice it over. Uh, it's a great question um, uh, as uh, the, the questioner rightly kind of points out, this is foundational. Uh, and so there are several sections of the toolkit as you'll be pleased to know um, or to find that, that directly address this, notably pages eight to 10 pages 15 to 16, which is opportunity one, and also in the appendix, page 46 of the toolkit, uh, which includes uh, resources for how to help get grounded or to get uh, do this foundational work. Mm -hmm. So it's a great question, and I, I want to just highlight some of the sections of the toolkit that address um, that question. Yeah, thank you, Rishi. And, and a related question, I think, is another one that came in from Anonymous about, you know, when organizations are finding some resistance to the work and tips or advice for that. Um, and I'd suggest the similar resources in the toolkit about, you know, it's that foundational work of getting grounded. Um, the other piece, um, and then I'll see if my colleagues have others, other items to offer um, is, and you know, not everyone in their organization is at this particular level, but many on the call have mentioned um, you know, the need for embedding this as, as part of the work, you know, not an add on, not a separate side special project, part of the core strategy of an organization, part of the strategic plan. Um, and so that also helps to really just embed it and not only as a core value, but as the core work of an organization, which over time can help with, I mean, it's change, it's change work in, in many ways. Um, also want to acknowledge that sometimes when I've heard of resistance to the work, it's less about resistance to advancing racial health equity work. And it's more about resistance to doing change and taking on more work in a period of time where there's just tremendous burnout and a lot of demands placed on our health workers um, in every type of organization. So there's also sort of more global systemic pressures that go with this as, a, as that, that's at least what I've heard from some colleagues and organizations, as opposed to the specific, specifically resistance to um, advancing health equity. Rebecca, I'll just add to that and also just uh, try to answer a question that came up in the chat too and invite right. um, other colleagues to answer this. I, I think the resistance comment is such an important, what you shared is such an important one. I think one of the, the things that I'll, I, I also know that in the toolkit um, we we address and, and try to also address both directly as well as through case studies. Uh, there's a lot of good examples of both um, in the, the body of the toolkit as well as towards the end with specific case studies that try to address the reality, the real context that everybody is in when it comes to that question of um, change management and what, how to move forward to an incredibly important set of work around racial equity um, in a time when everybody has been um, so swamped uh, with work and overwhelmed in many cases, especially in the light of the pandemic. One of the other things that we call out is the fact that um, resistance sometimes is this, it manifest through, well, let's focus on what we can do and, and that's somebody, like, that's, that's the payer's job or let the policymakers kind of figure that out. And once that happens, then we'll take care of this. The toolkit acknowledges that there are uh, two different, really important um, frames of accountability here from ensuring racial equity is, in, is advanced through primary care. One is certainly kind of uh, a set of accountability systems that are external to primary care practices uh, through payers, policymakers, et cetera. And, and that's a very vital and important kind of frame and, and a area of accountability that needs to be strengthened uh, to advance equity. And, and we, we certainly um, acknowledge how important it is for uh, in the toolkit for, for the work to make sure that we're also thinking about how to advocate and, and continue to push for um, changes external to the practice. Uh, but we also very clearly in this toolkit frame the opportunities for improvement within the frame of accountability, accountability that exists within systems, primary care systems. 
And it's important, I think, in conversations around resistance to be able to make sure that people, um, that we don't use uh, external accountability changes that are necessary as an excuse to not actually uh, do what we need to do internally as well. Okay. Um, both external and internal systems of accountability need to be challenged and improved to be able to advance equity. Um, Raina's question was about categorization, just pivoting to the kind of technical question in there. And I think, um, Raina, as you'll find in the, in the toolkit, um, there are some specific resources, including links to OMB, but there's also um, a, a few additional uh, bits of information um, located in Opportunity uh, 2, uh, in particular, to help um, answer that question with more specificity. So uh, really look forward to any follow-up questions that you may have after you've had a chance to uh, look at that section. It's such an important question about uh, race, ethnicity, uh, data categories, how to align those with minimum standards that have been developed by the OMB. Um, but we also highlight um, examples uh, of ways to make to ensure that, for example, patients are allowed to select all that apply or mm -hmm. choose not to respond, and also um, provide links to resources to be able to collect more granular data to reflect um, the diverse racial, ethnic, or linguistic diversity of your of, of your uh, geographies um, as well. So it's a great question, and you'll see some things and opportunity too that might be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rishi. Um, and, we, and we've got one more question from Amanda um, that I'd, I'd like to just, I, I'm just going to, I'm going to ask it live and if we take a minute, see if anyone would like to respond. And if we're not able to get to an adequate answer, um, this might be a good lead in to sort of what comes next and how else can CIN and Health Begins and Health Force support your work. Um, so the question is, how would you envision a health plan balancing the work of using this toolkit for internal assessments within the organization while also supporting provider networks in their assessments and use of the toolkit as well? And Tisha, with, I, I put an answer in the chat there, but I, I would love to hear from your perspective of the plans or, or maybe our uh, uh, Lauren or, or Kristen as well. Just, just curious your perspective on that. Um, uh, but I, I think we've, we've been hearing that this might be helpful as part of a provider relations um, kind of work to be able to support action on identified racial inequities, but really, really want to defer to you guys. Um, I, I'll provide some feedback if that's okay, Rebecca. So um, I mentioned in my my little spiel about uh, you know having the the forum and the structure in place to allow this dialogue to happen. And so we are in the process of expanding our um, quality improvement committee uh, to really layer in more health equity. And that committee is really robust. It's really big, and it includes internal staff operations and it includes external providers and we're going to be expanding to include even more uh, external providers and we have some of those community engagement pieces being pulled in that that's how i see it right as the first step is socializing it getting the feedback the transparent discussion about how can we use it and then you assign ownership provider relations help the providers out internal team socialize with your team um, so that that would be um, something that I would share that I think would be helpful at co connecting those uh, internal and external stakeholders. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for offering that insight. And there, um, you know, doing this work, um, you know, requires, I think, you know, requires sharing, you know, what are we learning from our organizations, you know, most organizations are doing this work um, and, and we're all learning as we go. And so figuring out the best ways to share that information um, through venues like this and others um, is, is also a fantastic um, thing to be doing. So thank you all for your questions. We're just gonna briefly um, go back to those seven opportunities again. You know, Now that you've had a chance to learn a little bit more about the different opportunities to advance racial health equity and primary care that are in the toolkit, the resources and the approach that, um, that has been taken with the toolkit for how you could use it, hearing a bit from work group members as well. We wanted to do an, another quick poll to get a sense of which of these opportunities do you feel most confident about advancing in your organization? So it's a little bit different than our first question about you know, which is an area that you're planning to work on or as a priority. Um, and it's really about where do you feel confident um, and, and, and able to, to really take this toolkit, take your knowledge and expertise from other places and, and advance the work. 
So we'll pull up that poll. <clears throat> you can just pick your top two choices. And then we'll share. And the reason we're asking this question and, and then we're gonna ask the flip is, is, is because we're trying to get a sense of how else to support all of you doing this work. Um, it's the what comes next. This toolkit has been designed very intentionally to be practical, to be used by all different types of roles and levels of people within organizations. Want to emphasize again, you know, please don't wait for organizational buy-in. You know, anyone can pick this up and do something with it. Um, but to continue to do this work, to really codify and embed it in all of the different care improvement workflows. Um, will take a lot of continued and sustained efforts, and we are looking for ways to support all of you. So we'll go ahead and close this poll, and we see, we're, and you'll see the results of a lot of confidence around the collecting of the data, um, and then a bit more spread out across the other categories as well. So we're going to go ahead and and go to that then the next poll, which is the flip of that question. Um, which is what's an area, and we're going to ask you just to pick one um, within these seven opportunities where you feel least confident about advancing in your organization. And so you just pick one for this one and appreciate this feedback um, as we think about what comes next and what comes next together. Right, we have about half of folks responding. I know it can be hard when it's to, to pick just pick just one area. <laughs> um, and these will be this will be really interesting. We'll close the poll in just a few more seconds. Great. Great, thank you. Thank you, Marie. So you can see these results um, are, are quite a bit more spread out across all of the opportunities, but with some critical mass on that last one about how do we actually inform and then accelerate that institutional transformation and get to community action. Um, I think it is worth noting too, that e that's, that's quite a lot higher than all the others, but also around opportunity four with 16%, you know, once you've done that data collection, actually doing the stratification and analysis to identify the inequities. So that's, that's really helpful. Um, so thank you for that feedback. The, um, just the last thing we wanted to do before we close for today is, you, you know, again, we're looking for what comes next. How do we continue to support? Even just on this call, it was helpful to hear some of the questions and then hear from Leticia about, well, here's how we do it in our organization. So we'd like to invite you all and your colleagues, whomever you share this toolkit with, whether you're asking a staff member to take this on or whether you are leading a team doing this work, um, to come to some implementation huddles in the fall. These will be facilitated discussion and support. This will be a chance to ask those questions in real time. Like, hey, I'm, I'm struggling with this issue. How are you working through this? Do you have any resources you can share? So it'll be problem solving, peer support, and it'll also provide a feedback loop so we can continue to improve the toolkit and identify additional resources um, and technical assistance to advance racial health equity. Um, these will be informal. We're going to drop those registration links into the chat now. We'll also send those out at the end of the webinar with the recording, with the toolkit, with the registration links. Um, but please take advantage of these. We've used similar models for other approaches, and we've gotten tremendous feedback that it can be really helpful to just have a place to come, talk to peers and other organizations as you're doing the work live. Um, so please consider that and come. And if there are other ways that you would like support, please go ahead, drop that in the chat. If you have ideas or needs, um, we are here for that um, and excited to support you all moving forward. So as we wrap up, I just wanted to give a huge, huge thank you to our work group. Huge thank you to Health Begins. It's been a tremendous partnership 
so incredibly excited about seeing this toolkit in the field and most importantly, seeing how it can address disparities and advance health equity in California and across the nation. So thank you all. Uh, we will follow up with everyone who registered with the recording, links to toolkit, links to the registration, um, the registration links for the huddles. And if you haven't signed up for the CIN newsletter, please do. That's the best way to stay apprised of other opportunities to support health equity work. Thank you all.